Hi. This is the last Boxity video. I'm very excited about this one. We've done a lot of videos about Boxity. This has been, I find, a very challenging topic. Um, and hopefully you found it helpful. Clearly we're not covering everything you could ever imagine to do with Boxity. It's a huge library with tons of functionality, but I hope that you got an overview and an introduction. And, um, and you know, someday, well, uh, you know, maybe I'll add some or make this better or something like that. But before we end all of this, there is a huge thing missing. A huge thing missing. I mean, if you even sat down to make a project with Boxity and all you did was try all the stuff we've learned so far, you would realize you're stuck. Why are you stuck? So here's, here's something interesting about using a library. We're, we're very thankful. Thank you, Boxity. All this complicated physics and collisions we could never possibly handle it ourselves. We're so glad you're handling it for us. But we have a problem. We would really like to know when the things are hitting each other because you know when this hits that, we want the user to score a point in a game. Or when this hits that, we want it to explode into a beautiful fireworks particle system display. We need to do something. We need to know about when the, I don't know who I'm talking to over there. Hi. Um, we need to know about when the collisions are happening. This is a trade-off. A library does a lot of stuff for us, so we don't have our hands into the code to find those moments when the collisions happen. But of course this is a problem, a common problem, and of course this is something that Boxity opens its doors to and says, you know what, we're going to give you that information. And it's done through something called listening. You can listen for collision events. In the same way that in processing, you can say void mouse pressed and trigger some code when a mouse, print, pr mouse press event happens, you can also, in Box2D, say void <laughs> begin contact. Now there's a little bit more to it, but this is really an analogous scenario. Mouse press, capture event, serial event, these are all functions that get triggered for you when an event occurs, a click of the mouse. There are collision events, and when that collision occurs, an event is triggered. Now, okay, before we can get to this point of what goes in this function, we need to figure out how do we even make this function work, like how do we even get to the point where this function is going to be something that we can use. So there's a couple steps. One thing that's really simple is we must Enable collision listening. Enable, a little awkward silence there as I write this down. Enable collision listening. If I go to an example that we're about to look at, we can see this is as simple as adding one line of code in setup. Box2D.listen for collisions. This tells the pbox2d library that you would like to listen for collisions. The reason why this isn't on by default is there's some extra overhead in managing this. So why have it on if you're not going to use it? But as soon as you, as soon as you enable listen for collisions, then this function is going to become activated. If you write this method, the code here will be executed at the moment two objects come in contact with each other. Now, I should point out that this is the only one we're going to work with in this particular example, but there are other types of collision events. There's something called end contact. End contact is the moment when two objects that have hit each other stop hitting each other. So you can also trigger events the moment that that collision is over. Another function is called pre-solve. One of the things Box2D has to do is it has to solve that collision. When those two objects hit each other, what's the solution? What's going to happen to them? What are the false forces, the impulse? What are their velocities? What's happening? You, Proxy will actually tell you, hey, I'm about to solve for this collision. This is a way that you could disable a collision if you want to disable it for some reason. There is also post-solve if you wanted to dig into the guts of that solution as well. Ah, I've solved the, collu the collision. Here's the solution. If you want to manipulate that or analyze that, you can do that in post-solve. But we are not going to use any of these in our examples. These are sort of beyond the scope of what we're looking at. We just want to trigger things that happen at the moment of impact. A score goes up. An object changes color, breaks apart, something, some type of event occurs. So if you recall, here is this example we're working with. We have written this object called particle. Particle is the thing that's moving around the screen. And I'm going to run this example. You're going to see these particles. When they collide, they're going to turn red. So this example is demonstrating the moment those objects collide, uh, they turn red. We can see there is a function in this 
particle class that's called change, which sets the color equal to red. So how do we figure out? Here's the essential question. The moment this begin contact function is triggered, how do we know which two particles, um, which two particles collided? Well, here's the thing. The begin contact function sends, is, sends in as an argument an object called contact. And in my examples, I have abbreviated, I've used a variable named CP. <laughs> Not for any good reason, just to think of contact point, that's what it used to be called. That's a sort of, this is, eh, <laughs> okay. You could pick a different variable name, C, contact, con, whatever you want. I called it CP, it's sort of arbitrary. So here's the thing. What CP will tell you is it will tell you, I'm looking over here because I have some notes, it will tell you, here's our steps. Okay. CP is going to tell you which fixtures collided. Remember, the fixture is the entity that attaches the shape to the body, and the shape is the thing that has geometry. So really what box D at the moment of contact is two shapes coming in contact with each other. Shape one and shape two. Shape A and shape B. But these shapes are really at, are, are attached to fixtures. So if we know the, the fixture is what box D is telling us. These two fixtures, fixture A and fixture B, have come into contact. So one of the things about fixtures is we could say, hey, which body are you attached to? So step one is the contact will tell us which fixtures have collided. The fixtures will tell us, hey, we're attached to a body. Now, the box 2D body is the physics engine, that little point that's moving around that has the location, the velocity, all that stuff. What we want, remember, is this particle object. We want that to affect that particle object. So what we need to do is say, which particle, now this is our thing, object, is associated with that body, right? So this is all given to us from box 2 d box 2 d says these two fixtures collided. The fixtures say these two bodies are the ones that we're attached to. It's up to us to now figure out through some mechanism the particle class is our thing. Boxy doesn't know about it. How do we then pull up which particle is associated with that body? Because remember, each particle has a body variable attached to it. Now, this is, there's a little magic in box 2 d that allows us to do this. It's something in the body class called set user data and also get user data data. These are key functions. Set user data, get user data. They're part of the body class. What do they mean? We're allowed to say, hey, I made a box 2D body. I want to give it a name. I'm going to set its user data to the string Jane or the string Fred, right? You could assign any object as that body's user data, anything arbitrary. What we're going to do is assign the body's user data that particular particle. So that later, when we know which body has collided, we can get that user data back out. Right? Assign, let me say that again because I'm a little confused myself. We have a body, we, will, we have a particle, which we've made a, part of, a body inside of it. But look at this. We want to say, hey, we made that body. Let's set its user data to that particle. So now we've bound those two things together. The body is part of the particle. The particle is body, part of the body. They both have a reference to each other. So that later, when we finally figured out which bodies have collided, we can say, what's your user data? That particle, change that particle's color. Hey, other body, what's your user data? Oh, that other particle, change that particle's color. Kind of confusing, but hopefully this is beginning to make sense to you because it's starting to make more sense to me as I talk about it. Okay, so I think this kind of covers the game. There's one little missing piece that we've missed here, but let's start to look at how this is done in the code and we're going to see this missing piece. So step one you can see, as we've, I'm already showing you here, is that when we make the line of code that we're adding to our particle or box class is to always set that body's user data. And now let's go back to the collision listening, the main program, right? We've written a function down here in the bottom called begin contact. And here's that first step. Step one, which fixtures collided? Which fixtures collided? Okay, 
Step two, which bodies are attached to those fixtures? And now, step three, get the body's user data, get the body's user data. But look at this. The body's user data is a generic object. It's a generic object. We actually now have to determine, hmm, what kind of object are you, right? So the body, the user data is not going to keep track of what type of data was set for its user data, just that an object was put in there. So it's up to us to say, hey, if the object cl class is a particle, if both objects are particles, right? Because what we're doing here in this particular scenario, if we look back at this, is we're only turning them red when a particle has hit another particle, not when it hits a boundary. Remember, there's boundaries in here also. So we're saying if those objects are particles, cast them as particles and call that change function. So if object-oriented programming and java e stuff is all new to you, this is going to look like gobbledygook. I mean, it looks like gobbledygook to me. It's kind of horrible, actually. And I wish we lived in a world where this isn't the code that we had to write. But just, you know, you read this over, even though the, the syntax is weird, what we're saying is if the object is a particle, if object one is a particle and object two is a particle, then two particles collided, make those objects into particles and call the change function to turn them red. So we could even just change, like look at this. If I just said, hey, if object one is a boundary, then change object particle two. Now look at what's going to happen. Now they're turning red when they hit the boundary. Now we got lucky here because we really should check, well, it could be that object one was a particle and object two is a boundary, or object one was a boundary and object two is a particle. So we probably should have revised our if statement in a slightly more flexible way, but you can see where this is going. We can start to determine which kind of objects collided. Are you a boundary? Are you a particle? You know, break, you know, if enough particles hit that boundary, break the boundary so that it's no longer there. There's so much you could do here with collisions. I mean, I don't even have to give you an exercise. Just make events happen when things collide in your box to sketch. That's an exercise for you. Make colors change, fireworks, increase the score. There's so many things you could do. So, um, so this is a complicated area. We've just covered kind of the surface of it, but um, hopefully it makes sense to you. And uh, this is the end of Box 2D. For now, the next set of videos, we're going to look at Toxic Libs, which is another physics engine um, using something called Verlet physics, which is really geared towards springy, connected systems. And there's a lot of real benefits to using Toxic Libs. Um, uh, over Box2D, and we'll talk about that. For one, it allows you to do stuff in 3D, which you might want to think about. Uh, the main thing, the main difference is that Toxic Libs does not have collisions. But now I'm just rambling, and this video should really be over. And so I will say goodbye, and good night, and good luck, and all those kinds of things, and goodbye.